Yeah, um, that's, it's such a great question. Um, and I think there's a lot of different ways I can answer it. But I think what's yeah. speaking to me at the moment uh, on how to answer that is um, knowledge of the business is just is king yeah. uh, or queen. Um, it, and I feel that had I been able to master more, like a company like Hilton, it's 95 years old when I walked in the door. Uh, it, we had 12 different brands at the time, different hotel brands, and you know we had hundreds of attorneys. And so to have the luxury of time onboarding there to really dig into how the company, you know, the intricacies mm -hmm. of how they, uh, how they uh, made money, I just did not have the luxury to do that at that time. Yeah. And I think each subsequent role since then, I, that I has been more and more and more of a focus. And then at Atlassian was one of the first companies I with where they were like, please don't do any work for the next 60 days. Please learn yeah. the business. Please, like, just, you know, leaders coming in, you've got to take that time to really understand it. Um, and so I think, so the, the answer to your question is they were they were different in that respect. Each company was different. I feel mm -hmm. like Uber at the time, you know, was the height of just, uberness and yeah. what was going on in the world at the time right and they were all you know scaling and 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 every month every week there was something new uh happening there didn't have the luxury to be able to do that so it, again yeah. coming into an environment where it's like we're already behind we have 300 lawyers we have the largest outside council budget i've ever seen in my life yeah um, there just wasn't the time to be strategic in some of those ways and i feel like now call it macro and economic, call it maturity, whatever you want, you know, now taking that time and the value that's placed in that is coming in as a new leader mm -hmm. um, is exactly where I, where I want to be. If I could take myself now and bring myself back to Hilton in yeah. those days, oh, game changer, game changer. <laughs> they would have been even luckier to have you because uh, they would have been, you know, fully resourcing you to your your full over. potential. That's yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. You can do over, but you don't get the second chance, but yeah. you can learn, pay it forward. Yeah, I mentioned in the beginning, I was, since I was the only person, I was doing a lot. So I would say the first hires were really geared around keeping me sane. <laughs> I'll be honest. <laughs> it was it was a very interesting set of, or, or a very easy set of criteria for uh, it, I I don't need to do this anymore, and I desperately need someone to do it. So let's hire right. that person. <laughs> right. And so actually, one of the first um, hires since we were a broad international based business, even as a hundred fifty to two hundred person company. We had offices in 12 or 14 places. Wow. So having an EMEA understanding, an Asia-Pac understanding, and being able to do close to real-time business there mm -hmm. uh, was important. So one of the first hires was an attorney um, who could handle the EMEA business. Um, and we actually hired him in uh, in Minnesota first because there was a still bulk was um, was, uh, us, but we had enough of Mia so that we figured the time zone was a little better. And then we hired an EMEA attorney after that. Um, and so that was kind of how we, the first thing was very revenue contract based. Mm -hmm. Um, so it was very, I would say reactive. I didn't have a great strategy there. I'll, I'll just to be candid, I, in hindsight, I'd probably think about doing things a little bit different in the sense that I think more about which I did, I think, at the next stage of hiring, more about multi-purpose players, you know, because then you're getting into the series D and E and F type of uh, scenario where you're not really sure exactly what you're going to need, but you need people who are flexible and can react quickly and, and are willing to jump in on mm -hmm. unknown things. Um, so for me, that was really important at that stage. And then as we got closer to the IPO, I knew that we needed specific skill sets. I knew we needed somebody who was dedicated uh, or knew a lot about privacy, knew a lot about product development, knew a lot about SEC reporting. You know, those types of things became more important. Um, so that's on the skills side. But I also really tried as a, as a manager with a growing team to be conscious of the fact that my experience in the past was I, I was very fortunate to have great managers along the way, people who were very understanding and forgiving if I made a mistake. Um, 
and uh, people who were interested in my growth and my team and the team's growth as a whole. So that stuck with me. I always had, like, for instance, one of my managers at Adobe, he was always, every time we would talk about our weekly accomplishments and goals, he always would say, well, what did you get out of it? You know, did you, was it something that personally made you happy or what do you want to accomplish? It will be a personal achievement for you. You know, that was always part of it. Um, and I appreciated that. It wasn't just, here's the corporate objective. What are you doing? A, B, and C. Um, mm -hmm. It's, it's a, tra you know, it's a mutual relationship. It's not a one-way thing. And then also at Adobe, I got to credit them. They created the most fun environment. I mean, the group there, we had these amazing offsite, you know, it could just be go out to dinner or it could be, we had a couple of offsites where we went up to the Seattle office, you know, as a group for the, the team I was on. Um, things like that just created this bond, this culture, this closeness, even though geographically we were spread out a little bit, mm -hmm. um, it just felt like we were family in a lot of ways. It just felt so comfortable to work with that group. And I always wanted to recreate that uh, to mm -hmm. the best I could. I don't feel like I was as successful at it as they were. <laughs> you know? um, but I think that was another thing was really understanding that I, I always would prefer hiring for people that make the workplace feel like a better place to be than mm -hmm. just focus on the skills. Like make it where people want to be part of it, whether that's remote or in person, you know, that's, it doesn't really matter. You got to invest in building that kind of cultural tightness. Mm -hmm. in your team. So those were things that I really, I probably uh, thought about that on the later side, particularly as we got into the public company side, because once you get into the public company side, I felt like it was more. We also had to focus on redundancy or uh, ability to scale at the right time, but not overspend on our hiring or like the hiring became much more tactical about, but you still have to hire the right fits, you know, for your sure. team. But it was really like you're more, I felt like we were more constrained because we were a public company and the GNA, you know, spend thresholds become more important. I think that Belichick or Parcells or Landry, like that's a role model for me. I, I huh. think the current number is 12 of my former Solar City and Marketa folks um, have been GC or are currently GCs right now. That's incredible. Uh, and telling that you intentionally, that you, you think about that, 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 that you keep track of that, that that's a sort of a model that, that you, you wanted when you were leading teams, right? And building people up and setting them up for great success all throughout their careers. So, so how are you recruiting, right? Like, what are you selling? Because you're selling, in, in essence, you're selling yourself as mm -hmm. a leader and you're selling the company. Those are the only things you really have to sell. And so if you want to be selling as a leader with a unique selling proposition, we say this in sales, a USP, uh -huh. my USP was I'll invest in you, I'll mentor, I'll coach you, I'll grow you. And if you want my job, you can have it when I'm done with it, or I'll get you another one that's better, mm -hmm. right? And, and yeah. that's the deal. And, and that deal worked for me for, you know, I was a GC for 19 years. That deal worked because yeah. that's investing in people and, why wouldn't it work for everybody? Why can't that street go two ways? That's a very fair bargain. Uh, I would take that deal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, me too. Me too. And I got that deal from a number of folks in my career. But but back to the point at, at Wilson yeah. uh, and, and Fong and then bringing Fong over in Solar City's IPO, you know, you just have to focus on what's in front of you. So, mm -hmm. you know, there's a there's a racing, there's a racing um, statement about, you know, drive the track in front of you. And wherever you drive, wherever your eyes look, the car goes. Mm -hmm. So do not look at the wall. Do not look at the skid marks and the big blemish on the wall at the track. Yeah. Drive to where you're going. And so yeah. with, with the IPO at Solo City was, okay, let's focus on what we have today in front of us right now. Let's not, let's not focus on, on the share price. Let's not focus on a year. Let's not focus on the lockup. Just do the work that's right in front of us. Because mm -hmm. what we control as human beings is very minute, but we can control where we put our attention in a given moment. 
I think I would start by saying it's absolutely an art and not a science, um, <laughs> uh, for sure. Um, I think also just to go back a step is it's very rarely that it's the general counsel saying we should expand into this market and we should set up an entity there and we should, you know, get people on the ground. It tends to be, um, it tends to be more that, that the business is, is driving that for growth. And I find that in all of the roles I've had, when we're looking at expansion, my first question is always, okay, I understand that X customer or, you know, you know, means that we need to have somebody on the ground in this particular country. Okay, right. What form does that need to take? And so it's always about like trying to understand from the business, what are they trying to achieve by bringing somebody in, in this particular country that we don't operate? Because I think Mm -hmm. that then gives you a bit of a path to what's the sort of, what's your recommendation in terms of the, um, in terms of like the legal framework that should sit around that can you actually get a get a you know do you need to have the last resort should be an all singing all dancing um local yeah. entity um because it comes with a very significant amount of compliance um costs and sometimes it's absolutely the right things to do but it's definitely worth mm-hmm. pushing the businesses to why they want something rather than them just saying well this is this is this is what i've decided we're doing so it's worth just pushing and being clear on like well how what's the best most cost effective way of achieving that mm-hmm. in terms of my scaling out of my team um, at, at Lime, um, I scaled out our European um, operation, legal operation, um, pretty considerably um, when I arrived at Lime. And I think, again, it was the sense that some of our most significant markets are in Europe. It's important to have attorneys who can speak the local language, never underestimate sure. how many documents that will arrive in in the local language. Um and also to kind of just understand the cultural sense, sense sensibilities. I mean, many businesses, most businesses these days, they're global, but they're incredibly local as well. And so thinking about how you make that work locally means that often you do need, I think, local um, local insight. I think one of the things is to be very grounded around what you actually need in that particular region, because sometimes mm-hmm. it might be quite different from what you need in a head office capability. And so, you know, to be pract- to, to be practical, like in a head office role, you may need a product counselor who's got deep experience in product counseling with a lot of technical expertise around kind of like privacy or like product development. It may be that if it's more of an operational role in Europe, you need someone with quite different skills. So my team come from a very broad array of, of kind of past experiences. I have mm-hmm. litigators, I have regulatory lawyers, I have property lawyers, I have a, a sort of broad range of people who bought different skills that I felt were sometimes needed to that particular region. So maybe one region is very, very advanced in terms of how it engages with cities. Maybe one is sort of quite quite early in that in that journey. And so you need mm-hmm. to be really grounded about what you need now. And I think also not always hiring somebody super duper experienced. Sometimes, sometimes you actually need someone quite junior and you know you're going to have to to kind of coach them. So I think you have to spend a lot of time about thinking what's actually going to get the job done there and what's realistic. So be realistic of where you actually are rather than where you want to get to. Because if you hire the wrong person, mm-hmm. it may take you longer to get to where you, get to where you want to go. Um, I think using headhunters can be really valuable. They can definitely... Yeah bring a perspective that you might not otherwise seen. I think obviously we use a lot of LinkedIn for our recruiting, a lot of building out a network. Um, Sometimes talking to local council can be helpful if you've managed to find somebody who can sort of appreciate the sort of different dynamics of where you might be HQ'd and and where you're operating. So those are all tips. My most thing is, is spend time thinking about what you really need and also make sure you've bought your business your business along with you in what you're looking for Mm -hmm. as well I certainly had um I failed I think to fully appreciate that in one country (laughs) and I hired a really experienced very very good lawyer and then actually it turned out that a lot of that person's job was going to be handling like genuinely almost administrative matters and it took a while to like communicate between the business and the lawyer to like work out that their their what their role should be so yeah bring your business along and be realistic about what you need 
so, you know, when I joined, I was relatively junior in my career. My experience was all in the corporate transaction space. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, you know, I was joining a company that obviously was like heavily immersed in a sort of like a a legal and regulatorily tricky area from day one. And so even before I accepted the job, I was very clear to to let the co-founders know that I'd be requiring budget for outside counsel to complement my own skill set because I knew that I didn't know it all. And that was the sort of same philosophy I had as I went to build out the legal team. I really looked for people um, with skills that were different from my own. So, you know, some Mm. of the first people I hired both had litigation backgrounds. You know, another Mm -hmm. early hire was had an employment background at the time insurance, well, still today, insurance is very big for us, but at the time it was within my purview. And so I, you know, hired someone with insurance, insurance expertise. And it was only like five or six hires down the road that I ultimately hired, you know, another corporate person to effectively sort of duplicate myself such that I could be in more of a leadership role versus a Mm -hmm. practitioner role. Um, And, you know, I looked for people who were diverse And I looked for people Mm -hmm. who were better than me at their jobs. And, um, and I did that, you know, knowing full well that like some people might be threatened by bringing in a cohort of folks, uh, who were, you know, really, really good experts in their fields. Um, but for me, like this was the ticket to success and, and I was very right to bet in that way because, all of these people that I'm talking about, you know, very quickly gained the trust of the co-founders and other management because they were so good at what they did. Mm-hmm. And many of them, um, some of them are still at left today, by the way, and, um, a, you know, a decade later, and, and others of them that have since gone on stayed a long time and have gone on to really amazing things. Yeah, and the answer to that is yes, conclusively, I do. If you come interview for a job with me, I will not ask you a single question about what your experience is. You could come to me with 30 years of experience in my sector or not a single second of experience. I'm going to ask you the same questions because the answer is that my own experience has told me that it just isn't that relevant. I don't (laughs) care what you've done. I don't care what school you've gone to. I don't care like where you've worked. What I care about is... Like, does the job I have or the opportunity I have, does it vibe with what you're looking for? Does it fit into where your next step is? Because Mm -hmm. ultimately the thing I care about the most is are you going to lean in here? And I don't mean lean in like in a Sheryl Sandberg, like let's write a book about it type way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. (laughs) Are you going to be like excited to try and figure this thing out? Because the experience I had when I like more or less bluffed my way into that first job at turn was mm-hmm. like, I was like, man, I need a paycheck. I have a three week old baby and no job. And once I got in there, I was like, okay, I can, I, I see it. Like I can start to see the parameters of the thing and see the outlines of the puzzle. And then I started getting really into figuring it out. And I was successful in that role, mostly because like I was into it. Like I mm-hmm. wanted to work product. I wanted to learn the business. I wanted to figure out the mechanics. I was like going to dig into like the deal negotiations with the business people. I was going to spend the time with them. I built, made great friends there that are still, you know, my great friends 12 years later. Like, and that was because I was totally into it. And the lesson I came away with that is that the subject matter is the easiest thing to teach. Yeah. Teach is like, you're wanting to do this because you could be the smartest guy on the planet or gal on the planet. You could be, uh, the most credentialed, most experienced human being there ever was. If you don't want to do it, if it is not something that is energizing to you, that, that like fits into where you are in your life, Uh you're not going to be successful. I have no interest in having to put my boot in somebody's backside to get them (laughs) up to to work. Right. Yeah. Good. You are. I want this to be the best possible place for you to work. And so like I tell Mm -hmm. my team all the time, like there's no hostages on my team. I don't think you did a better job someplace else. I want you to go. I was yeah. talking to a recruiter for a hiring and he's like, don't worry, I won't poach your people. I was like, poach them. 
Coach every one of them. Like, <laughs> if there's a better job out there, I want them to go do it. Because I want you here because this is the right place for you. And mm-hmm. I want you here because you're like the value transfer works. I'm learning the right things. I'm getting the role that I want. I'm getting the affirmation from being great at my job. All these sorts of things that ladder into, to me, the environment that I'm most successful in. Yeah. Do you have a favorite interview question to tease that out? Uh, so I ask a series of scripted interview questions. I don't want to get too deep into them because I do ask them to people. Hey. And I, I want to like get like <laughs> reactions. But generally what I'm trying to test for when I am interviewing people, the things I want to see is I want to see an aptitude for mastery. Meaning <laughs> like I want to see you want to be great at things. I don't care what it is really. I don't care if it's collecting fountain pens. Uh, I don't care if it's like playing soccer. I don't care if it's legal stuff. Like Mm -hmm. I want to see you think of yourself as somebody who masters stuff. Mm -hmm. I want to see somebody who wants to be autonomous, somebody who wants to own the work, somebody who's going to think of the projects I give them as like, I'm the quarterback. This thing is mine. Yeah. I'm going to rise and fall with this. And like, I will be mad at you if you come and try and work on this project because this thing is mine. Yeah, (laughs) because I want to see that level of desire for sort of autonomy. And I want to see people who are jazzed by significance. I want to see somebody who is like, hey, the thing that matters to me is mattering. It's not Mm -hmm. about like the paycheck. Look, paychecks are important. You got to make enough money to like take money worries off the table. But like, sure. I want you to be in a position where if I told you, hey, you can come to job A and I will pay you twice as much money and you will be a cog in this machine and it'll be like interesting work. Be able to run. Or I can give you job B and you'll make 40% less money, but it's going to be on you. Like this thing's going to rise and fall on you. If you are like unequivocally, yeah, give me job B. Like, yeah, the money will come. Like I'll make that comp later, but like I want to be in it. Then, uh-huh. like, then we got something. That's a, that's a good question. I think about it a lot. Um, I think there's a few things. Um, for me, I provide my team with a lot of autonomy because I think that's what people want, right? So, I mean, I can also do that because they're amazing, right? Like they do great work. They're very committed to the company. They're very good professionals. Um, and most of them are... I mean, it, it, I also don't have people on my team who it's their first job out of college, like that kind of thing. Sure. Um, so I think providing autonomies, if you can, is invaluable to employees. Um, they also, for the most part, get to work completely remotely, which is not <laughs> true. That's not true of all the other teams at Away. Um, uh-huh. But to me, that's a retention lever. Um, and also something that I always try to offer is um, the opportunity to learn and to do new kinds of work. So I always say, even when interviewing or recruiting for my team, I always say we decide on the, you know, what the role is working on. Um, it's based on two things. One is the needs of the business, but two mm-hmm. is what are you interested in doing, right? So it's both of those things. Um, so if someone on my team says, you know, I want to work more on the brand side. I'm super open to that conversation, right? Okay, what does that look like? What kinds of things do you want to work on? Let's keep an eye on that. Um, Because like me, I think they want to learn and that makes their experience more rich. And it's something that they could take with them to their next job. Sure. If they want to do that, right? Um, So those are kind of the things I focus on. And also, I think like we're lucky we have a team that we all like really get along and we like each other and we like working together. So I think that really helps. The abstract is now on YouTube Shorts. We interview general counsels, head of legal ops, COOs, and even a few CEOs on our podcast. Hit subscribe to hear from the brightest minds in legal and business.